In this video, we'll take a look at the design of a basic storage element called a latch. We'll open with the operation of a basic latch called a D-latch, and then work towards showing how it can be implemented using basic logic gates. We'll introduce the notion of feedback as a mechanism for storing a bit, and then show the design of a classic latch called an SR latch using just NOR gates. We'll extend the design of the SR latch to a D-latch, and then show a better D-latch design using switches. Here's the basic operation of a latch. The latch has two inputs, a data input D and a write enable EN, and a single output Q. If we take the EN signal to 1, the latch is in write mode, and as we change the value of the data input, the output follows the value of D. If we take EN back low again, the latch is in hold mode, and as we change the value of D, it still holds um, the value of 1. Thus, a D latch is a simple, basic, writable memory cell. The fact that it can hold the value of the Q output, even when the data inputs are changing, means that there must be something going on inside that's different from what we've seen with our basic combinational logic circuits to date. We can store the value of a bit in a logic circuit by using feedback. Feedback occurs when we take the output of a circuit and feed it back around to be an input of that circuit. To motivate the idea of feedback, here's three inverters connected in a ring. Let's say that we start with the zero as an input to the first inverter. This would get inverted to a one. The next one would invert it to a zero, but then the next one would invert it back to a one, which changes the input to the chain and so on. So what would happen with this circuit? Does it actually oscillate uh, or does something else happen? Here's a simulation showing that three inverters connected in a ring really does oscillate. So we've seen that three inverters in a ring gives you an oscillator, but two inverters in a ring gives you a mechanism for storing a bit internally in one of two nice stable configurations, with a one in the middle of the ring or with a zero in the middle of the ring. The problem is, how do we get that bit into the ring? Um, it turns out what we can do is replace the inverters with NOR gates, which gives us extra inputs for injecting values into the feedback ring. Here's a two input NOR gate. We'll label one of the inputs as the data input and the other as the control input. If the control input is zero, then the NOR gate behaves as an inverter as we change the value of the data input. On the other hand, if we make the control input a one, the output is gonna be forced to be a zero no matter what the value is for the data input. Here's our storage feedback loop with the inverters replaced by NOR gates, which we can think of as controllable inverters. We've labeled the control inputs of the two NOR gates set and reset, and the uh, reason for that will become clear in a second. The output of the uh, feedback loop is Q, and we've labeled the intermediate point Q bar. When set and reset are both zero, um, the two NOR gates are both behaving as inverters, and the feedback loop just holds whatever value was stored in there. Now, for example, if we take set and make it a one while keeping reset as a zero, the second inverter is behaving as an inverter, but the uh, first NOR gate is forcing a zero to its output. So we have a uh, zero for Q bar and now a one for Q. If we take set back down to zero, now both NOR gates are behaving as inverters and it holds the value. If we now take reset and make that a one, the second NOR gate forces a zero on its output. Um, Q changes and now if we take reset low, both NOR gates are functioning as inverters and the feedback loop holds the value. This is the same circuit redrawn so that the inputs are on the left side. Don't let the crossed wires confuse you. It's still the same feedback loop. 
This type of basic storage element is known as an SR latch, where S is the set control input and R is the reset control input. Here's the schematic symbol for the SR latch and its truth table. It's progress, but it's not quite the functionality of the D latch that we showed at the beginning of the video. Also note the bottom row in the truth table, where if the SR inputs are both 1, then both Q and Q bar are 0. This is kind of strange and a situation that we want to avoid. This is the symbol for the D latch and its truth table. It turns out that we can construct a D latch by appending some D logic to the front of an SR latch. The truth table below shows how we can do this. So um, for a D latch, what we want to have is when the enable EN is low, then regardless of what the value of D is, Q will hold its value. If EN is 1, then if uh, D is a 0, we should be writing a 0 to Q. And if D is 1, then we should be writing a 1 to Q. We can figure out what the values for S and R need to be for each of these rows in the table. So if EN is low, then we want both S and R to be low, which puts the SR latch in the hold state. If EN is 1 and D is 0, then we want S and R to be 0 and 1. And if um, EN is 1 and D is 1, um, then we want S and R to be 1, 0. From this, we can now find the equations uh, for what S and R need to be that are produced by that D logic, namely that S is EN and D, and R would be EN and D bar. Here's the complete D latch made by attaching the D input logic to an SR latch. As long as EN is low, we can change the value of D, and we note that the S and R inputs to the SR latch both stay at zero, so Q holds its value. But then if we take EN high, watch what happens to the S and R inputs. We either get S is a 1 and R is a 0, which sets Q, or uh, S is a 0 and R is a 1, which resets Q. Now if we uh, take EN low again, it will hold the new value. We can change D, and Q just holds the 1. Looking at this circuit design, we see there are quite a few transistors involved in being able to just write and store one bit. Each of the two uh, NOR gates has four transistors involved. The two AND gates each require six transistors, and then the inverter requires another two for a total of 22 transistors. It turns out that there's a much more efficient way of implementing a D-latch if we take advantage of switches. Here's a much simpler latch design that takes advantage of switches to control whether the latch is in hold mode or in write mode. The design has two switches. First, there's a switch on the input um, that's controlled by EN, but there's another switch in the feedback loop that's controlled by not EN. So one of those switches will always be open and the other switch is always closed. We use an inverter um, to generate not EN from EN. So in this configuration, um, when EN is zero, the uh, latch is in hold mode and the feedback loop is closed. And no matter what we do um, to the data input, the latch holds the same value of the output. But if we take EN to a one, then we see that the feedback loop is open and we're in write mode and changing the data input will change the value of the output. So now if we change the uh, input to a one and then uh, take EN low again, we see that the latch is now holding a one. And if we change the value of the data input, that one stays held. This design only uses six transistors plus two more to generate not EN from EN. 
observant students sometimes wonder, does this actually work? Or while the switches are in the process of opening and closing, can the feedback loop somehow lose its data? The answer is because of the capacitance at the output. Um, the data is held while the switches open and close. This simulation shows what happens. So we'll change uh, EN to being a 1 so that the uh, latch is in write mode and we can see the capacitor at Q charging and discharging. Then um, when we switch EN back to zero, we see that the data is firmly held. And if we switch the data input, since the uh, input switch is open while EN is low, the uh, value of Q doesn't change.